Um, so, housekeeping. First of all, just remind you, your assignments are now up. There is two sorts of feedback you get for assignments. First of all, if you go back to your original document, open it. I've tried to annotate, put lots of little... I don't know what it looks at your side, which is why I'm sort of being non-specific, but you should be able to go through your document and there should be little bullet points and next to information about what feedback. Not every feedback lost a mark. Some of it was just, look, you should know about this. So, you know, please go back and just do that. As I said, the biggest thing I noticed is you do need to learn the fine art of every time you do a step in your proof, unless it's algebraic manipulation, let me know what you did. And even if it's algebraic manipulation, make it easier for the reader. Simple things like, you know, expand the brackets collected terms means that when I'm going through it, it makes it a much easier follow for me to do, to go, let me think about your logic. Also, that means that there is a, and the same with code. Code needs comments. Every function at the start should have a thing that says, ideally, when you wrote it, who wrote it. But the key things I'm looking for is what your inputs, what your outputs. It's very useful. Also, I really like inside code where you have the comments that tell me what you're doing. You'll show me your thinking process. So if you do make a mistake, I can still give you marks. And if there's a mistype or something like that, so. Um, no assignment due this week. It's a week on Friday, so you've got two weeks to do the next assignment. Um, and that's already up and ready to go. Please come and ask me if you have questions. So there won't be a consulting session this Friday because remember Friday this week we have a workshop. This week's workshop is going to be on RCPP. To get RCP working, you need a compiler working underneath. So if you're on Windows, you need to get R tools. And you just, I don't know how to do it on Windows. So you'd have to follow the instructions, but talking to people, the instructions are not too bad. Mac, you're gonna need X tools underneath it because you need a compiler to get it to work. To check it's working, once you install it, everything, there's one slide, you've got some code. If you copy and paste that into R and run it, it should compile and run and give you a function that works. And then on Friday, we'll go through the actual how to do RCPP and a little bit of profiling. What else do I need to... I know I'm gonna read it. <laughs> Very nice. Um, what else do you need to know? That's about it. Remember, with the coding, if you have any problems, First of all, if you can find me in my office, you know, I will help you or make time to help you. Because I know some of you, it's all a bit new. But the main thing is EMG 13, I have booked it for just this group from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. So go and work on stuff together. And then you can also, from 10.30 onwards, I will be there to help you. So I, I get there at 10. Unfortunately, I have a meeting at 10 till 10.30. I booked the room long before the meetings were organized. But, you know, we can come, you can ask me questions, I can give assistance. If I can't give you assistance in that time, we will make a time to do it. Other than that, assignments were really, really good. I was very impressed. When I think you've gone from some of your basic R to starting of advanced R with map functions and nested data frames, you all did very, very well, which is very pleasing. Cool. Any questions at this point? Everyone sorted, everyone happy, it all makes sense-ish? Perfect. Cool. So we started, we've got this framework, we've got our model, and then we said, well, let's start getting a better model, some sense of better. And last time we started looking at choosing our set of variables, and we did things like, um, you know, best model fit, we did forward selection, backward selection. And then we thought, I mean, the main thing we'd like to do eventually is get something with the best test mean square error. So how do you actually measure that? And what I mean by test mean square is not how good it does at predicting this data, but how good it will go at predicting data in the future. Because I can always choose a model that will predict my data perfectly. I just return the same data. It's a nice, easy function. It's great. But it's going to be diddly squat use in the future. So the whole idea is we'd like to say, roughly on average, what will be the error rate for data in the future, which you call the test mean square error. And how do you measure that? Well, one you can, way you can measure it is with cross-validation. That's probably your gold standard for your best estimate of your test mean square error, but it's computationally intensive. We can't always do it. So people came up with some measures that were meant to represent an idea of what your test mean square error would be. And we discussed them last time. We had CP, we had Mallow CP, 
I went back and checked the original paper. I also went and spoke to Gary, and he said, yes, it's always been called Mallow CP. The original paper had P predictors. So the P and CP came from the fact the model's P predictors, but people for some reason have kept calling it CP, even when you might have a model where you've denoted it with K predictors. So in the future, I will make sure it has P predictors so it matches, but it's not as if people ever talk about CK. It's always CP. According to all my resources, why it's called CP was a reference to the first guy who did it, which was, his first name was, I can't remember, it was starts with C, and then he's called Mallow. So that's why you have the Mallow CP. It seems to be a reference to himself. So good on him. Um, but yeah, just in case you do, everyone seems to call it CP. It's not like it, the test statistic is C reference into the number of parameters, always called CP. And there is an original paper out there, and if people really want it, <coughs> send me an email, I will, you know, share it around. But I don't think it's it's an old it's an old mass paper. You know that old mass paper that really is some of you all read the old mass papers at some point and they're horrendously hard to read. Yeah, this is one of them. Okay, so that's all our methods so far. And we've got AIC, BIC, Mallow CP. These are estimating our test mean square error. And generally what they do is they set up, they have some sort of measure of how well your data fits, but a penalty term. And what we're trying to do is find the smallest model we can get away with. What we're going to do over the next few things is we're going to look at what we call shrinkage methods. So now in these methods, we're going to fit a model with all our p-predictors, where we're going to constrain or we're going to regularize the coefficients. So the idea is that you have a some sort of system that sort of says, let's shrink them coefficients down. Some just sort of shrink them. Some actually try very harsh and actually push them towards zero. So let's think about how we're going to do this. So let's have a recap. So our least squares is what we often do. We have our RSS, our residual sum of squares. And what do we do? We take our observed data, our YI, and we take off our fitted values. So we have an intercept, beta zero, and we're going to have our B, J, X, I, J. So we have a coefficient for each predictor. So you take your observed and you minus off this model, which is a linear combination with an intercept of your predictors. We square that, that's our measure. We then go and choose our values of beta that minimize that. That's our least sum of squares. To some extent, the you know what we're doing is in the name. So that's our standard form. I'm going to start with ridge regression. There's two shrinkage methods we're going to look. We're going to look at ridge regression and the SU regression, and sort of keep comparing and contrasting them. So in ridge regression, the coefficient estimates, which we'll denote with the, up, um, the superscript of R, are those that minimize this function here. So you can see the first bit is exactly the same. That's our sum of squares. But I've added a penalty term. I went plus lambda. So lambda is going to be some non-zero tuning parameter. It, obviously, if it was zero, you'd just get your sum of squares back. And what it's doing is it's taking every coefficient, it's squaring it, and it's adding them all up. So it's taking into account how big are those coefficients. What I'd like to do is I'd like to reduce that. It's a penalty. If I'm going to have a lot of big coefficients, I'm going to get penalized for it. And you can use your <coughs> tuning parameter. Um, to some extent, if you set lambda equal to infinity, you end up just getting the intercept. If you set equal to zero, you get your least squares. Notice that unlike what I normally do, where I get all my indices wrong, this time I was very careful to get it right. In our second term, our penalty term, our j goes from 1 to p. So there's no penalty term for your intercept. The idea being that if you, as lambda gets larger and larger, you basically end up just returning a single model with the intercept. Okay. So that's what I just said. The term lambda i equals one to p. Remember, it doesn't have the intercept in there, where you're just taking each coefficient, you're squaring, it, and I know it's called the shrinkage penalty, and it shrinks the estimates towards zero. Because you get it's like it's like you've got some money assigned to you, and you go right. You can have so much squared coefficient, and there's going to be a, a restraint on that. And you see later you can actually do this as a not a constrained optimization problem as well. 
But the whole idea is you're saying, I don't want huge, big coefficients. That's going to cost you. So try and get the coefficients as small as possible. So we'll have a look at an example to illustrate how we do this. So we're going to look at the credit data. So the whole idea of the credit data, I can't remember what we're actually going to fit it. We're going to look at income and do -do, what's why balance. So with this, we have um, individuals. We have measured the uh, individual is ID'd with an ID number. We have their income, the limit, et cetera. So remember this data was looking at um, credit lending to various people. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the balance, their bank balance, based on some predictors. So first of all, I'm going to have to do a little bit of manipulation. Unfortunately for me, the standard way of fitting ridge regression and lasso regression doesn't accept the standard formula approach. You have to do some of the machinery for you. So normally when we do a linear model, it would be y tilde x1 plus x2 plus x3. And what that formula notation does is in the background it goes, okay, you lazy shite, I'll do some work for you. First thing, I'll look to the left of the tilde, that tells me the column, I'm going to grab that, that's going to be my y vector. And then it looks at the rest of the tilde and it converts that into your design matrix. Unfortunately, in this particular function, that's the standard one for using the serum ridge, you have to do that work for it. So, let's do some work. So. Um, first of all, I actually cheat because I can't be bothered creating that design matrix. And I said, let's do, assume I was doing a linear model and I had balance tilde dot, where first of all, I've selected just balance and then the predicts I've got are income limit student rating. So I have four predictors. By going balance tilde dot, that formula gets converted into my design matrix. I then went and used the model dot matrix term. So at any point you have a linear model, if you actually wrap that linear model with model.matrix, it will return what R is doing under the cover for you. So if at any point you're not sure about all the different formula things and what they actually do, for example, how categorical is represented, etc., run the linear model, wrap it in a model.matrix, and it will spit out the model.matrix so you can actually look at it. It's actually quite useful. So this returns, and here's my matrix where the first column is a column of ones for the intercept, and then I've got something as nice as I have four columns, one for each predictor. It doesn't want your intercept. So the next thing I do is I remove the intercept by basically selecting minus one. So that minus one just says get rid of the first column. So I just quickly created a matrix that has a column for each predictor and has the observed value. So the first row will be all the observed values for the predictors for the first individual. I then grab my Y, and Y is just going to be set to credit balance, so I'm ready to go. Now, if you think about it, with that tuning parameter, I can have a different model <coughs> for each value of lambda. So what I'm going to do this is I'm going to give it a grid of lambdas to try. So the first line I've done here is I've created that grid. So I've basically taken a sequence of number, in fact, I've taken 100 evenly spaced numbers between 0 to 4, and then I've just 10 to the power of that. So the first one would be 10 to the power of 0, so it's 1, and so I've just got a whole range of values. I just wanted quite a large range of values evenly spread over my sort of 10 to the power of space. Now, to do ridge regression, we're finally ready to do it. You use the GLM net package. Sorry, um, function. You give it your predictors, which is a matrix, X. You give it a response variable, which is a vector Y. You set alpha equal to zero, because that tells it you're going to do ridge, as opposed to next lecture we'll do lasso. And then you can give it a grid of lambdas. If you don't, it will create a grid for you, but I wanted to actually have a pre-specified grid. <coughs> So what I've done here is I've grabbed what it's fitted, I've grabbed all the coefficients, and I've predicted the estimate of the coefficients for my different values of lambda. So on my x-axis, I've got increasing values of lambda. And on my y-axis, I have the estimates of 
well, first of all, that big purple line is the coefficient associated with student. You have a coefficient associated with rate. In fact, nearly all of the coefficients, pretty well, you can't see. Once lambda starts getting large at all, they all get shrunk towards zero really, really fast. You can probably just see the very far left, a little, sort of small little bit of my income appearing. So it's taken all these parameters, as lambda got bigger, that you get that extra constraint, it shrunk those coefficients down. Okay? Does that imply that students have a higher balance? Because the category has student, yes, and it's got a very large coefficient. Um, they have less yes, to remember the, these are not normalized. Student was just a zero or a one. So the reason that coefficient would be large is the two possible values are zero or one. Well, if we go back to the other ones, so student is just yes or no, zero or one. So the coefficients are always going to be large compared with, for example, your limit or income are quite large. No, your limit is in the thousands. Well, what I was saying, would students have a larger balance than people who worked? That, does that seem a bit odd? does seem a bit odd. I mean, these are the coefficients. It's a positive coefficient in that model. Mm. So it seems to imply that the students have a larger balance. Yeah, seems a bit odd. It does seem a bit odd. I haven't actually gone and explored the data in that sense. I just sort of ran the thing and had a quick look. I wanted to see the coefficients change over time. Whether they pass my stupidity test? Probably not with this data. But if you think about it, as lambda gets bigger, a lot of your coefficients disappear and we're left with just student being your main predictor. It's almost like it's doing the, the sort of the, the model selection automatically for us. You know, you could have done this and eventually said, student seems to be important. But it's not just taking into account what's significant. To some extent, and I would normalize this data, and we'll talk about normalizing the data, but it does take into account what's important. Because it's not just whether your coefficient is significant, but whether your coefficient is large. And you've got that subtle difference between just because something is significant doesn't mean it's important. There's nothing worse than you go, I fact fit to the model, and this coefficient, you say to your collaborators, has a really small p-value, so it's a significant predictor. And they go, brilliant. What happens if I increase that by one? You go, your balance increases by 0.0004 cents. You know, and they go, yeah, but I, what? And it is a hard you, conversation you'll continue to have with collaboration. Significant doesn't mean important. Not only do you have to look at what the p-value says, you have to go back to see what the coefficient says and interpret that in context. Okay. So scale invariance. So let's go back to least squares. The nice thing about least squares estimates is let's say you have your data and you adjust it. Let's say one of your predictors was height and it was in inches and someone comes along and said, actually we want it in centimeters. So you just adjust it. Does it change your results? No. It will change the coefficients, obviously, but if you think about it, your new coefficient, so if I went, if I took my xj, which is my jth predictor, and I multiplied it by some constant c mm -hmm. to get a new xj star, then the coefficient for my new predictor, which would denote as beta j star hat, would be the old predictor divided by c. No? If you increase every, thing by times it by 10, your coefficient will be 1 tenth. And the nice thing is, is you find that if you look at your fitted values, your xj beta j hat will always be equal to xj star beta j star hat. That your fitted values won't change. You increase one, you decrease to make it the same. Ridge regression does not do this. Ridge regression, your results, your coefficients, the weighting that will get changed will depend on the scale your original predictor is in. Which comes straight from the conversation that, you know, Josh asked about, you know, well, with a student, is that important? I mean, I, I stole his question to say, well, interestingly, the thing about student, its values were zero and one, while other predictors have values of all in the thousands. So you sort of want to take that into account. You want them on a similar scale. 
So how do you do that? Well, the rule of thumb is that you should standardize the predictors. What you should do is you should take each predictor and you can divide it by the variance of that predictor. So you're standardizing it to get all on a similar scale before you start messing around. <coughs> Notice I'm not centralizing this data, I'm just standardizing it and dividing it by the variance. Why? So they're all on a similar scale. They all should roughly be on a similar sort of range of values because you've already standardized them. They won't be on the same amount of values around zero, but they will be on the same rough scale. So if you think about the range, before some could have gone from zero to a thousand and one go from zero to one. Once you've scaled it, they should all go on a scale of really zero to one. You just norm, I don't want to use the word normalize because that applies out. You standardize it so they're comparable. The problem is as soon as you standardize everything, then the interpretation of coefficients gets harder. Because now you're talking about well, what's the change in income on a standardized stand, standardized? Standardized scale. Okay? So there's always that balance between doing the right thing statistically and making it still interpretable within the context of the problem to the collaborators you're working with. PCA is a classic one. Everyone loves PCA until they ask for interpretation. And we'll get to PCA, uh, obviously, later in this course. So, what does it do? Well, remember, we've got this general approach we keep doing, which says, <clears throat> as your model, in this case, as lambda increases and the flexibility of the model decreases, you're adding constraints, so your flexibility decreases. Every time we decrease flexibility, we decrease variability, but we increase bias, or well, we tend to. Remember that bias variance trade-off. Flexible models are great. They have low bias, but high variability. The other way is unflexible models, they tend to have low variance, but they tend to be biased. So every time you look at one of these things that's going parameter, you have to say, well, what happens as I change that parameter? In this case, as lambda increases, then the flexibility of the model decreases, hence, the bias increases, but the variance decreases. The nice thing is, if I gave you a lambda, you only fit in a single model. Actually, ridge regression and lasso regressions are fast. Yes, you might want to try different lambda values, but if I give you a single lambda, you're solving one problem, it's bang fast. So ridge and lasso are very fast, which is nice. Especially compared with subset, where you're trying lots and lots of different models. So how do we select lambda? The classic way is cross-validation. You know, take some data aside, fit your model with cross-validation with that lambda, calculate your test mean and square error from that, then go and try a different lambda, get your cross, do that and compare them. The nice thing is this is pretty well standard. So. To be honest, if I really want to do cross-validation with um, Ridge, I can just do cv.glmnet, give it x, give it y, and it was just fast. It's a single command and it does it. Does glmnet standardize the predictor speed? Um, there is a default in there that you can set it to, say, standardize. Mm -hmm. I think the default is don't standardize. Standard are philosophy. Don't faff around with data unless people have made a conscious decision. Um, the nice thing is when you fit that, you can then, one of the things that's <coughs> contained with the object you get is lambda min, which is the lambda that minimizes your cross-validation error. So in this case, the lambda it decided is 1.02909. Other nice thing I discovered is you can do a plot. If you take that and you plot it, for all different values of lambda, it gives you a nice little indication of your mean square error. And you give some, it doesn't actually, these lines here aren't actually the low points, they're the range of values that it seems that are equivalent. Okay, so how's it actually doing this? Let's think about how it's actually doing it. So I'm going to set up the matrix notation to do this. So now, 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify the problem. So here at the start is my formula. I've got first of all my RSS, so each observation minus the fitted model, all squared, sum, plus my penalty term. I want to be able to deal with that intercept, so I'm just going to cheat. I'm going to make it nice and easy for myself. I'm going to center every predictor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each predictor and I'm going to take off the average. Now by doing that, it means I can pretty well get rid of the intercept. Yeah, because I've averaged them all. They've all averaged around zero. If you set them all, you would get the value you want. So now I'm going to have a new design matrix which just has P columns. Basically, I got rid of the intercepts. I've set up, I've centralized them all. I've now got rid of the intercepts. I've just got a matrix of my predictors. So you think about it now, I can write that formula because I got rid of that intercept as, first of all, something we recognize the observed data y minus x beta, my fitted values, transpose y minus x beta, so that first term is my RSS, plus lambda beta transpose beta gives me my second term. So I've written it in a matrix form. And once you've got in that matrix form, you can actually solve it. I haven't done it for you, but here is the new form. And hopefully there should be a sense of deja vu, a little bit of deja vu, because let's have a look at this. My beta hat is x transpose x, looking good. Ignore the plus something for a stage. Minus one x transpose y. If I was doing least squares, my standard form would be x transpose x to the minus one x transpose y. Instead, what I've got in that inverse is plus lambda i. So that is identity matrix with that lambda along the diagonal. Cool. In fact, the interesting thing is the, the way I've introduced ridge regression is the wrong way around. The original development of the methodology said, how do we deal in the cases where x transpose x is not invertible? You know, especially when they had terms that were very highly collinear, you got ill-defined matrices, they had problems. So they went, well, let's just cheat. Let's just add a bit. Let's add a bit so we can invert it. Then it turned out that that was the solution of the problem I gave you at the start and that's how you actually set up the problem now, it's ridge regression. In fact it's called ridge regression because the original problem was when you started to look at your estimate parameter space, if you got two variables that are highly correlated, you got two estimates that are highly correlated. When you look at sort of your your maximum likelihood space over two dimensions, you've got this ridge, this idea, instead of having this single point, this single point in your space, your maximum line estimates you're trying to get, you got a ridge of possible values. And the idea was, how do I deal with that ridge? I will add an extra constraint. Because you've got an infinite number of sets of values that were just as good, you added in this constraint. So the whole idea is you're adding this extra positive constant on the diagonal, and that will make the problem non-singular even if x transpose x is not a full rank. So that's originally, it was just a, a solution to a problem they couldn't solve, and they went, fine, we'll add this extra bit. But then they realized it was actually a solution to something quite nice, and you've got the way I described it is the way you should think about it. What's non-singular again? Uh, non-singular means you can't invert it. Uh, you ask about linear algebra, it basically means that its determinant is close to zero. So how do we actually do this? Because let's face it, if at any point you find yourself going, I'll just use the solve command, or I'll just invert a matrix in any sort of program, you're doing something wrong. Hopefully most of you did numerical methods, and if you learn one thing from numerical methods from Lewis, it's don't try and invert a matrix. It will sometimes, the worst thing is it will give you an answer, but the computer's given up and just guess it. Oh, that's the floor. No. You know? Don't try and do it. So you often use different methods. So I'm going to explain what it's actually doing, give you a little bit. So we're going to discuss single value decomposition. So what's single value decomposition? A lot of standard computer methods take a matrix and they split it, they decompose it into other matrices. There's the Kleski decomposition, there's the QR decomposition, this is the single value decomposition. This is the most useful method that we won't teach you in first year because it's a really useful method and that's not what it's about. 
It's about you doing stupid calculations with three by three matrix because if you can't reduce a matrix, well, how could you get on in the world? Very, very easily. Fucking waste of time. Because <laughs> you know, being able to do a three by three matrix is just so important to your life. I mean, that is, I spend most of my time, people just come in and go, we've got this three by three matrix, can you reduce it? I go, yes, I can, yes. Thank goodness you'll pay me good money for that. So the single value decomposition of an n times p matrix x has this form. It's going to be u, d, v. So it's three matrices multiplied together. And it's of a particular form. First of all, the columns of u and v all are orthogonal. <coughs> so if I take any two columns and I multiply them by doing the dot product of them, I will get zero. Because they're basically right angles to one another. Also, your D is going to be a diagonal matrix with basically zeros everywhere except for the diagonal. And the diagonal, I'm going to order it such that they're scalars. They're all non-zero scalars. And the one in the top left corner is going to be the largest, and they're going to be in decreasing order. Now, I've done a little bit of a cheat here. I said orthogonal means that u, t, u equals i. It doesn't quite. That means orthonormal. I also assume that I've normalized each of them columns, so when I multiply them, to themselves, they get a distance of one. That's because that's what standardly is done. But all the text you look at will talk about orthogonal, but actually what they should be more precise to say they are orthonormal. So that is, they are right angles to one another and they all have length one. Okay. Let me show you how this is done in R. So I'm going to create a very simple matrix, which is a three by two matrix, and it has the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. And there is an SVD command in X, sorry, in X, in R, that I can do. And when you do it, it spits out three things. It spits out, well, it doesn't spit out the diagonal matrix D, it just spits out the diagonal. It spits out your U and it spits out your V, all ready to go, okay? So being cynical like me, you first of all go, well, I better check it actually does what it says on the tin. So first I recreate my D, I've got my U and my V. So I've been told that these three matrices, when multiplied in a special way, should return my original matrix. So I checked. So I went U times D times the transpose of V, and there's my one, two, three, four, five, six. I've also been told they're orthogonal, so I better check. So I went the transpose of U times U. You might argue that doesn't look orthogonal, but at any time you get enough diagonal that's 1.1 times 10 to the minus 16, that's as close to zero as to be zero. Luckily, the second one, it was really next to zero, but that's just because you're, you know, you're machine excellent type stuff. So that seems to work. It works quite nicely. So how can we use this? Well, first of all, let's go back to least squares. You can show, I'm not going to, you can show that your fitted values x beta hat, which we know is, our beta hat is x transpose x to the minus one, x transpose y. So if I pre-multiply that by x, you can actually rewrite that as u, u transpose y. So think about the steps. You take your matrix, you do SVD. That's a standard built-in, that's one of the standard linear algebra techniques. You grab your u, and you just go u times u transpose. There's no inverse there at all. Okay. I haven't told you how you get the SVD. That's beyond this course. But it doesn't involve a lot of inverses. So you're actually now solving your problem without ever actually doing an inverse, okay? So it works really quite nicely. It's also a bit of a lie, R doesn't do that. If you really wanna know, there's some very interesting work about R and how it actually does linear regression. It actually uses the QR decomposition. Uh, I got fascinated at one point and I, I actually foolishly asked Gary how it works. And two hours later, I knew exactly how it works. It's great. Can't remember it now. Also, I lost at least two years of my childhood because go explain something to me. But it is, you know, every so often you get fascinated about why something works. It's very nice. There's loads of normalization equations. Quite cool, but not important. Okay, so that's how we could do our least squares with this idea of single value decomposition. <clears throat> what about the equivalent for ridge regression? So let's remind you. We said our x beta hat is going to be x. So on left multiply, I've got my x transpose x plus this extra cons along the diagonal, inverse x transpose y. If you substitute in 
your single value decomposition and use the properties and do some manipulation. And this is something I've tried on my whiteboard. It does actually work, thank goodness. Out drops ud d squared plus lambda i minus one d u t, which you can rewrite eventually as that form. You've got these d's, you've got your lambda, you've got your u's, <coughs> you've got transpose. The final form again doesn't have an inverse. And what you're doing, if you think about it, is it's very similar to the previous one, but you're shrinking down. How are you shrinking down? You've got that extra shrinkage term in the middle, that dj squared over dj squared plus lambda. Okay. So what's that doing? How's that shrinkage working? Well, if you think about it, if your dj squared was large, then that middle term wouldn't change that much, would it? Because it's basically, when dj is large compared with lambda, you're getting something that's close to dj back. But when dj is small, it's going to have a huge effect. It's going to get shrunk more towards one. So the main thing that middle term does is it shrinks any term that has a small dj squared. Okay, so what does that mean? What terms have a small dj squared? Well, Roughly what we're doing here is we're doing an eigenvalue decomposition. And when we get to PCA, and we'll do PCA actually twice because it's important, I'll explain this in more detail, but roughly anything that has a small gj squared would indicate that it's a variable that has a low amount of variability compared with the other variables. So rough rule of thumb, I'm not going to do the math, dj can equate to the variability of that predictor. So. Predictors that have a low variability end up with a small dj squared. Small dj squared means they're going to get shrink, shrunk a lot more. So this is what's happening underneath the cover. It's basically looking at each thing, taking into account the variability. Ones that have huge variability, i.e. they have a lot of distance within them, great, keep them. Anything that has very small variability, shrink it and get rid of it. Cool. So that's it. That is ridge regression. Next week, we will start lasso regression, and then we'll do some compare and contrast between them. And then after that, we start doing splines. Any questions? Yeah, I'm just struggling to find a real world context where you'd want to do this. I'm obviously, by collinearity as well. Collinearity is a classic one. It's very fast. Like, you know, shrink your coefficients down. Why not fit a full model? If you can fit the full model, Fit the full model, use ridge regression to get it down. I must admit, I use lasso more than ridge. The classic one we've done recently is A-Line's been looking at um, predicting sepsis using lots and lots of gene expression. She has 27,000 genes. We've done a variety of methods using hypercubes, but the nice one is we just shoved it in lasso and we could just shrink down. And you can actually say, and you'll see next time, I tell you what, I just just only want the top 10 genes and it will shrink all them down to zero and they'll disappear and it does it fast. That's the classical. That's where I've seen lasso done a lot is, and in fact it's so common to use lasso in gene studies that the hypercube was an answer to that that said the problem with lasso is you get a single model, we want to do sort of ensemble methods to put multiple models in there. But it's fast, it's a quick way of doing it, and especially we have lots of predictors, it's a fast way to, to reduce that downfall so it's more inter interpretable. You can understand it. Thanks. Cool. See you all Friday. Thank you very much. Josh. When do you want to predict using naive bays? What form is the data meant to be in? Should it be... Um, really good question. And unfortunately, I, it's not... Uh, Let me stop this and then... We'll talk.